Hello, folks, and welcome to another lecture on metabolism. In the first lecture, you learned the basic concepts of metabolism as they occur inside of organisms and cells. In this lecture, we're going to look a little bit more closely at the energy of those reactions and how, by looking at the changes in energy, you can make some predictions about those reactions. You learned in an earlier lesson that the inside of a cell is a busy place, with thousands of chemical reactions taking place all at once. Many of these reactions are interconnected. That is, the products of one reaction are the reactants in the next. We call these series of reactions a metabolic pathway. They can be quite a complicated mess of interconnected reactions. Here's a schematic of a metabolic pathway of a potato disease. Don't worry, we won't be studying metabolic pathways in such detail. To simplify this, we describe a metabolic pathway as a series of reactions starting with a specific molecule which is then altered in a series of steps, ultimately resulting in a certain product. It's important to know that each individual reaction in the pathway is catalyzed by a specific enzyme. We tend to ignore the enzymes in lots of our explanations here, but they are important. You'll recall from an earlier lecture that there are two kinds of metabolic reactions that occur inside of cells. There are anabolic reactions, that involve building larger molecules from smaller ones. These reactions require a constant input of energy and are therefore endergonic, while others involve breaking down larger molecules and are exergonic. I hope that by this time you understand that exergonic reactions release energy and the products have less energy than the reactants, and that endergonic reactions absorb energy and the products have more energy than the reactants. From your reading assignments and a discussion in class, I hope that you're getting more comfortable with the concept of free energy and its relationship with the endergonic and exergonic reactions. Now, all chemical reactions, metabolic or not, are governed by the laws of energy transformation, also known as the laws of thermodynamics. There are four of them, but we'll only need the first two here. I'll let your physics teacher deal with the other two. The first law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It must come from someplace and then end up someplace. As energy changes forms, it appears that it comes out of nowhere and then disappears, but it simply doesn't. Energy flows through a system or an organism and can take on different forms as it does. The second law states that each time energy changes forms, some energy is lost to the environment and creates more disorder. This disorder is called entropy, symbolized by the letter S. So the second law translates into the fact that systems are always seeking a lower energy, less ordered state. How does this transfer when we look at chemical reactions? Well, we already know that chemical reactions involve energy. Understanding the laws can help us predict if a reaction will be spontaneous, that is, occur naturally on their own or non-spontaneously and require a continuous input of energy to get to completion. Look at the sample reaction here. You can see already that the products are in a simpler form. In order to be that way, the stored energy and the bonds that are holding the reactant together had to be broken, releasing the energy into the environment. This increases the entropy of the system. In other words, getting the products to a lower energy state. And that follows the second law. Large organic compounds tend to have what is called free energy. The symbol G is derived from Willard Gibbs, a 19th century professor. In fact, this free energy is often called Gibbs free energy. Free energy is energy available to do the work of the cell. If free energy is being released in a reaction, it can be transformed into the work of the cell. In other words, movement, growth, and reproduction. And when a reaction occurs, there is a change in the free energy of the reaction. Complex organic molecules have lots of free energy stored in their hydrogen-carbon bonds. When these bonds are broken, they release that energy, and only then can it be transformed into the work of the cell. Now the change in free energy can be calculated. In this formula, here, H symbolizes the total energy of the process. The term process here refers to a single reaction. You can see that if the total energy of the reaction is increased, then the free energy increases directly. 
Here you see the symbol for entropy. You can see that the negative symbol here tells us that if the entropy is increased, then the free energy will increase as well. Now T represents the temperature of the environment of the reaction. It affects the free energy in the same way as entropy. If it goes up, then the free energy decreases. You may know that the exergonic reactions often release the energy in the form of heat. An increase in temperature tells us that there's a decrease in the free energy. Once we know the change in free energy of a reaction, we can use it to predict whether the reaction will be spontaneous or not. Remember, a spontaneous reaction is one that, once activated, will continue on its own without any additional energy. What does knowing the change in free energy tell us? Well, if the change in free energy is less than zero, or negative, the reaction will be spontaneous and therefore exergonic. These reactions release the free energy and it's available to do the work of the cell. Now, the reaction that results in a positive change in free energy is not spontaneous and therefore endergonic. Here it is again. Spontaneous reactions release their free energy and so the change in free energy is negative. Notice that the products are less ordered than the reactants. The reverse of this reaction is therefore not spontaneous. The change in free energy is positive. In fact, these reactions get their energy from the energy released from the exergonic reactions in the cell. In fact, these reactions get their energy from the energy released by exergonic reactions that occur in the cell. Recall this transfer of energy from exergonic to endergonic reactions, energy coupling. The exergonic process of transferring a phosphate group from ATP to specific reactants forms a phosphorylated intermediate. Now that phosphorylated intermediate is unstable and therefore more reactive. So the hydrolysis of ATP is exergonic. In fact, the reaction has a change in free energy of negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Here's a simple demonstration of how energy coupling works. Imagine an endergonic reaction occurring. For instance, building an amino acid molecule from glutamic acid and ammonia to make glutamine. This simple reaction requires 3.4 kilocalories per mole of energy and is endergonic, so it's not spontaneous. It will not just happen on its own. However, if the reaction is coupled with the hydrolysis of ATP, which is a change in free energy of negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole, then there's enough energy, in fact, there's a surplus of energy to drive the reaction ahead. The net change in free energy is negative 3.9 kilocalories per mole. Delta G is less than zero, so the reaction will move forward spontaneously. This process is assisted by enzymes. Now, I didn't show the enzymes assisting the process because it makes the explanation more complicated. But you should know that enzymes assist nearly all metabolic reactions. It's just simpler to assume that they're there and leave them out of the picture. I like to think of the use of enzymes in a process as like having a coupon that reduces the amount of energy required to start the reaction. Well, that's certainly enough information to feed your brains from one video. I hope you have a deeper understanding of metabolic reactions and the energy used to drive them. I hope you took some good notes. If you have any questions, please write them down. Watch this video again if you need to, and we'll see you back in class. Till then, be well.